Basketball is back, and Bet Online remains your number one source for all of your sports betting needs this season. You'll always find the latest odds, team matchup info, player news, and game trends at Bet Online. And as your continued source for all of your sports wagering information, Bet Online features live betting, free contests, and giveaways all season long. Always the fastest and easiest way to bet all of your favorite sports and events, whether that's NFL, NBA, NHL, MMA, tennis, boxing, or even golf. Head to betonline.ag to join and receive your 50% welcome bonus with your first deposit. Make sure to use promo code BELIEVE, that's B-L-E-A-V, to receive your rewards. Bet online where the game starts. All righty, guys, we are live with another episode of the What's in Your Bag podcast with Andrew Robinson. I am joined, as always, by my co-host, Alexis Davis. And uh, today, we have a super special guest, you know what I'm saying, one of my most, uh, I'll say, uh, one of my favorite teammates that I've had, man, back in the day at, at Putnam Science Academy, current Detroit Pistons wing, New York's finest, Hamdou Diallo, man, Hamid. Thank you for joining us today, man. What's going on, man? Appreciate you having me. You know how we rock, man. Appreciate you. No doubt, man. See, I was, I wasn't sure which, which way I was gonna go with the introduction, man. You know what I'm saying? Cause back in, in the Putnam days, you know what I'm saying, you were probably my 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 biggest headache, you know what I'm saying? But you know, <laughs> you you you've grown and, and you know, we don't miss that, but early. You were more <laughs> than me We're gonna be that early. Facts, facts, man. But Nah, man, it's been an honor to see, you know, how how far you've been able to come, man. Super proud of your of your growth along the way, man. And uh shoot, what's it getting ready to be for you, man? Year year five, year six, what is it gonna be? Year year five. Uh, I mean, it's been great. I had a great offseason. Uh spent a lot of time with my fan. And it's been good, good, man. I didn't get to play preseason this year. I had a little uh, a little injury, but looking forward to game one. Just getting yeah. staying ready, so I don't gotta get ready. Trying to stay ready. But yeah, you're probably in the way. Some big things coming. Hopefully we'll be able to do special things in Detroit pretty much. But it's been dope. It's been a it's been a great, great season. Can't wait to get started next week. So. Yeah, so being that you grew up in Queens, New York, can you kind of just explain us how it was growing up in the New York basketball scene? Anything, you know, New York has added to your game, giving you that extra how we kind of see that in the way you play now. Yeah, I feel like New York, I mean, I feel like a lot of people ask me that, like, I mean, how is it growing up in New York? I mean, you don't, you, people don't understand New York until you really go to New York. So, like, you got to go to New York, be in New York for some time, and just understand the type of grit and grind that the city comes from, and the type of blue-collar people that are in the city as well. I mean, New York is a is a wealthy city. I mean, very wealthy, but there are a lot of blue-collar within those in the cities and within those in the communities. And it's just something different about us. I mean, I just feel like we were brought up different and we were brought up with a, with a chip on our shoulder. And I feel like New Yorkers are go-getters. Uh, nothing, nothing is ever really handed to us. And I feel like that's been, the, that's been the story of our career so far. I mean, just being able to be a go-getter, being able to go chase the dream every night, being able to get better each and every year. And being able to remain focused and remain humble at the same time. But I feel like New York, I mean, it's just, it's everything you can imagine in one. So, I mean, it's, it's a beautiful city. I love being from there, but it comes it come with these pros and it's kind of, I'm, I'm going to say that. Best city in the world, though, by far. By far. You, you 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 had to, you had to go there, you know. What I'm saying? You had to go there. Two, two DMV yeah. folks, you know, we had to ask Cap. Best city in the world. Yeah. I'm on the crazy thing about it, my whole staff team. I'm on like a DC team right now. Yeah, yeah, Troy Weaver, all that. We we running things over there, baby. From the top all the way to the bottom, we're probably DC. Now we argue about this every day. Yeah, DC so, people love DC. I, I commend you guys for that. But you guys are nowhere near, <laughs> nowhere near them, them major cities. Nowhere near, nowhere near. This guy's, this guy's crazy. This guy's crazy. <laughs> so, um, you mentioned obviously being a go getter, man, and uh, I think that you know that that definitely defines your story, man. Because I was in the gym 
when you got your first Division One offer, you and Mama do, man, from from Minnesota and uh, Temple, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, for sure. First, first high major. First high major. Yeah, first high major offer. Yep, first yeah. high major offer because you had some offers before that. First high major offer, first Pop Five offer, and uh, it's crazy because from that point over the next pretty much year, you know, you you blossomed into a guy who got his first high major offer to a guy who was a top twenty player in the country, you know, five star recruit, like. Just talk to me about that process, man, about going from essentially being an unknown to, you know, a five-star recruit from a guy who was getting, you know, low mid-major offers to a guy who had every school in the country, you know, calling calling your phone. Yeah, I feel like, so like a lot of people don't even really know like the story like of me, like going to put them on how that came about. So like I was in New York, of course, I played my first two years there and I was, I mean, I was I was an okay basketball player. I wasn't bad. I was like middle of the pack, uh, New York City guard. It was like all of these guards. I was like this is ahead of me and whatnot. I mean, I will always still give them a run for their money, but I never really like received the recognition like for anything I was doing in New York. So, and then I went to Putnam. I mean, I tried out for Putnam. I didn't go to Putnam. I tried out for Putnam, and. At first, it was like, oh, they didn't really want to take me. It was still like, still up in the air. I was young. I was going into a prep school that only took post-grad, and I was going to be like one of the first undergrads. So Coach Espo was real hesitant with it, but we came to an agreement. Like, all right, you're going to come to put them in. Your first year, you're just going to pretty much just like practice, work out, and pretty much just get, 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 get ahead of the speed, get ahead of the game, get your body right and make sure that you're able to play at this level because it's much more physical. It's like grown men. I'm like maybe like 15 at the time, everybody like 19, 20, 21, because it's post grad So I'm like, okay, cool. I'm cool with it. Mongo was over there. He did a year. So I'm like, okay, but I'm cool with that. I mean, I'll go over there be on my bro. And to stay out of New York, I was getting in a lot of trouble and stuff like that. So it was good to, for my parents to have that relief a little, little bit. That told I was somewhere good and I was doing the right thing. And, I was just worried about me and my dream. So, so boom, that's when I went out. Uh, I enrolled in Putnam. I came to Putnam. That's when I met you, your brother, everybody. We enrolled. And then, like, I'm working out. I'm working out with you guys. And I'm like, like some, I don't know. Something just clicked. Like, I belong here. Like, I'm not going to just be a practice player. Like, I, I really belong here. I'm really probably one of the best people in the gym. You feel what I'm saying? So, I mean, we working, of course. I mean, me and you, we know we put the work in at 6 a.m., 5 a.m., night time. I mean, we put the work in. And we was barely sleeping at Putnam. We both can attest to that, I mean, because we both lived it. We was barely sleeping. Alexis, we was eating Domino's pizza every night. It was rough. We was living rough, but we both understood, like, that dream that we had. It was nothing that could, like, even throw us off that that line that we was on, like we would have nights where we would just we had like a little common area where we would just all sit down and just talk about goals, talk about anything that's going on in the world. We would talk about it, and mind you, we're all sitting in the room. None of us thought we was ever gonna play professional basketball. None of us, none of us thought we would ever even. I mean, Drew and y'all, y'all came in. Y'all was known. Y'all had offers and stuff, so y'all knew y'all was gonna play Division One basketball. But like when I first got there, Division One basketball, I didn't even know what like NC Two A Clearinghouse was. I didn't know none of that. I'm just a kid from New York hooping. So then, I mean, I start playing, start playing, and then now it's come time for everything to get real. When coaches start coming in the gym, and as you said, we got the Temple and the Minnesota offer. But I feel like it was just bigger than that because like being a kid that went from like, all right, you gonna be a practice player or like a workout person, like not really playing to so starting on a post-grad team my first year was like a lot of things just changed so quick, but it was all a test to the work. So I feel like everything that everything that come back to it is just always come back to making sure that you're taking care of your business in the gym. And adversity is always gonna hit. Everything is not always gonna be a smooth path. So when adversity hit, I mean that's that's when you show your true colors. I feel like when you're at the lowest point when your back is against the wall nobody's with you everybody's against you that's when it shows like that's when the real 
that's when the, that's when I would say the boy gets separated from the man. When, when adversity really hits, like it dictates it. You show you show the same that you got. I mean, either you are gonna fold or you are gonna get back up and keep trying to fight to the top. So I feel like in my career, my small career, I mean, I'm only I've been a pro for five years. So my small career, I feel like a lot of times I hit rock bottom, and every time it's just those rock bottom moments is what make the star moments or the great moments of the 30 point, 40 point, 50 point nights feel so much better because you understand like when you are at rock bottom and you there by yourself, man, ain't nobody really with you down there. So I feel like being at rock bottom, I mean, I feel like that's where I'm most comfortable at. Right. Now, I think, I think you talked about it a lot, man, just that time at Putnam. And this is me from the outside looking in when I was at Putnam and just the things, even after I left Putnam, going to Quinnipiac and being around the team, I feel like when we first got to Putnam, obviously we did the the, the team 6 a.m. You know, we did the practices and stuff like that. Um, but I feel like a lot of times, as far as getting the extra work, like you, when you first got there, that wasn't really your thing. Like, I feel like me and Ace would be in the gym all the time, working, working, and getting in the gym. And it wasn't really be too many other people in there. But over the next couple of years, I talked to Espo, I'm like, yo, like, it's how I'm in the gym, bro. Is he getting, is he working on his game? Over the years, man, he told me that you became one of the hardest workers on the team. Like, he told me that you were in there by yourself getting an extra work. You know what I'm saying? He would kind of uh, develop your own work ethic outside of what we were doing for the team. And obviously, you go to Kentucky, and, like, you have no choice you know, but to do that. Like, I, I, I saw your three-point shot develop, you know, while, while you were at Kentucky. Um, and obviously, now while you're in the league, you're working out all the time in the offseason and, and getting in the gym. And I see you post with, with, with Chris Brickman and all that kind of stuff, like, just talk to me about that progression from like when you first came to the, to the school, your head spinning. Because and and this this is the first time I probably ever told you this, bro. One of the things that I always admired about you, bro, was like I feel like that first year for me, I've always been a guy who had to like, you know, being a shooter, bro. You're, my routine is sacred, but I had to go in the gym and shoot a certain amount of shots every single day. Like, yeah, that, that was me. And one thing that I always envied about you and Josh Wallace, bro. I felt like y'all two could come in the game. Like, we would have practice one day. I wanted to be y'all till practice the next day, and y'all would have 20, bro. And I'd be like, cuz, I'm in the gym shooting 500 shots, getting up at 6 a.m., and these dudes coming out raw talent and just, just hooping, bro. You know what I'm saying? Like, I was, I was always like, yo, like, how was this dude doing this? <laughs> Sheer willpower, bro. You know what I'm saying? He was a hooper. He was a hooper. Like, he ain't. He ain't work out. He ain't do nothing. That's why God still to this day. He know he didn't work out at all. Hooper. He didn't you work know what I'm As far as the working out thing, like you and Aaron, when y'all first came to put them, like the way y'all worked, I knew y'all was like working towards something. Y'all wasn't just like y'all didn't come to put them to just come to put them. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like a lot of people, like they go places now just to say that they're there. Like, oh, I'm, I went here. I went here. Like. I seen like you and Aaron, like y'all was on a whole different mission. Like, all right, they say I can't do this, they say I can't dribble, they say I'm just a shooter. Like y'all was in the gym. So it was like when I see that, I'm like, hold on, like that's they in the gym now. I can't that like my competitiveness in me couldn't allow me to see you and Aaron just the only people in the gym morning after morning after morning after morning. After morning. And you know, I was going was right upstairs. So when somebody in the gym, you're gonna know they're in the gym. Right. So you so like the competitive the competitiveness in me was like I can't allow that to happen. That's why that's when I started joining you and Aaron. And then that's when I feel like it just became bigger and bigger. The Keelan started coming, now Mom started coming. And then but I feel like as far as the work ethic, like you guys installed that in the Putnam, like without without a question, it was no, it was it was a big difference between the way you guys were working on and the way everybody else was working on. And that just shows like the different situations that everybody came from. Like you guys sacrifice everybody sacrificed something. Right. To put them, but not everybody value that sacrifice that person. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And yeah. you are well, you have you had the vision offers and you decided to come back to make sure that the little bro was good right. and take care of him and make sure that y'all do the y'all do the y'all do this whole path together. Cause I remember the whole time they recruited you. You like, man, I can just go to school. I don't even really gotta come but I can just come hoop. Chill with my bro, we gonna just do it together. And I feel like the whole work that they I just installed in there, and then from there it just took off. And come January, February, you just seen everybody in the gym. And that's what made us so successful, and I feel like so connected as, as, as brothers more than as teammates. Like 
we could lose a game and we wouldn't be worried. We could have a fight in practice, we wouldn't be worried because everybody was so connected and it was like nights we didn't even sleep. Like literally, we would be sitting there and then it would be three in the morning, take a little cat nap and then we just in the lab. It's like, and I feel like those are the days that you cherish because those are the days where it's like, I feel like I didn't value those days enough to live in that moment. If you feel what I'm saying, like, yeah. even like my time in Kentucky, like I just went back to Kentucky for midnight madness last night. Like, I'm just looking around, like, damn, like I really didn't value the values that that school really had for me. I was so worried about beating the next chapter, making it to the league, beating them. I didn't really value that. Which I feel like everybody, everybody is guilty to that because. At the end of the day, we don't play the game, we make it to the lead and take care of our families and X, Y, and Z. So that's always going to be the motivation and the drop. And when you really get there and then you really sit back, there's a lot of things that I took for granted that I wish like I had today. Like a lot of things that I wish that I had on the flag for me today. Like I was like Kentucky, like best school in the world. I still believe that. I mean, everything that we do in the league is the same thing, like how we doing at Kentucky, but it's like you wake up, I got a chef for me, he cooking me breakfast, I just tell him what I want, I'm going to, boom, get to class, work out, <laughs> come back, he making lunch again, then practice, dinner, chef's still there, he making dinner, it's like, now it's like, stuff. just like a little thing like that, now it's like, I got to worry about that, I got to get my own chef now, now I got to make sure that my chef is on his P's and Q's, because if he throw up one little mistake, it's like my whole day is thrown off, my whole routine is thrown off, so. Just little things like that that they have set up for us that at the moment it's like, oh, this is what's supposed to be done. And then when you start making a little bit of money, you start getting some getting some money. Nothing is nothing is taken care of for you. You have to put those values into yourself or you won't have it. So I feel like, yeah, of course the team still has a chef, the Detroit Pistons have chef and stuff, but like you say, and like you show to be one of those breaks, you gotta always go above and beyond. Especially when it's about your craft or when it's about taking care of your body or anything like that. You always gotta do above and beyond. And that's something that I, that's something that little do you know, like I learned from you now. I mean, yeah, you and now it's like the way you got it, we didn't have nothing at plan. We didn't have no trainer, we didn't have food, we barely ate something like you barely had hot water. Like we got some stories, we got some real stories. Stories I'm, for real. I'm, I'm, for the documentary. Right. Was, <laughs> but it's like it was like some real life events that was happening and everybody there didn't let anything waver. I can't I can't I, I don't know if like today's generation can do that. I don't know if you could tell the top 10 player in the country like yo go to this school in the suburbs, small town, 4,000 people, one supermarket, one piece of shop, one Chinese restaurant. You might have hot water in the morning. You might not. You might have bed books. You might not. You feel what I'm saying? Like, this is real life events that we were living in that, I mean, we cherished it. It was, it was an experience for us. And, like, I just went back to putting them in me, just being there and seeing it. And I got, like, a funny story. I'm playing. We playing pickup. And one of the young boys on the sideline, he just started, like, he just started like melting off a little bit. Cause I was like, I'm, I'm cool and like, he playing pick up. I'm not gonna take, take them serious. Right. He just started melting off. So like, I started really hooping. Like I run off like five in a row. And I look at him like, bro, you crazy. Like I really built this bro. Like, right. <laughs> like, like don't ever try to disrespect. And mind you though, like I still talk to him after like, I liked his mentality because that would that's the same thing I would have done, man. Scoochie Smith, um, anybody else would have came in the gym. Of course, I'm going to test you. And you better show me that this is what it is. It's not that I'm going to feel like it's, it's, not, it's not that. So just like the love over there is still dope. It's still dope. The city of Putnam is still dope. But Man, I remember that. I, I seen it in person when we played Brewster for the first time and you and uh, Don was going at it. I remember that. Like It was like, yeah, like you, you top 20? Yeah, all right. I'm here. Right. So they pushed us in our mouth for that first game. We were not ready for them. Nah, yeah. We were not ready for them. They the crazy thing is, though, we almost won that game. I don't know if you remember, bro. We It was a close game until the end. And they ended up pulling away. The they started, yeah, they started going crazy at the end. I think somebody, I think Mama might have got in foul trouble. They had no bigs. Facts. It was a close game, though. We, we was winning that. We was winning for a little bit. 
Facts. And that was the first time they really ever felt like anybody because they were just running through the left side. Right. Then Bill and Adam got a couple other guys. They were just running through the left side. But, but now, nah, yeah, those were the times, bro. Those were the times. Bro. You kind of talked about all the decision making and like the sacrifices that go into playing the game is more than just, you know, just showing up. And you kind of were faced with a big decision to reclass and go to Kentucky. Can you kind of talk about that decision and what, you know, what kind of made you feel like, okay, this is the right thing for me to do the next move in my career? Yeah, I feel like just being honest, I mean, just, I felt like I wasn't being challenged no more. I put on like I felt like the competition it wasn't challenging for me, and I was I felt like I was coasting every day. I felt like I knew what I could do. Like I didn't have the same drive that I felt like I already knew what school I wanted to go to. I knew once I knew once Calipari offered me, I knew I was going there. It was just a matter of Kentucky actually really wanting me and actually really making me a vocal point of that team that I was going to be a part. And if that was going to get done, it was no other school that uh, pretty much to the chance of me. Because once I seen the presentation and once my dad seen the presentation, he's like, there's, there's no way, there's no way you're not going there. He seen Cal pulled up a little book. But yeah, I did $1 billion in NBA contracts. <laughs> my dad really needed to hear nothing else after that pretty much. I mean, but I just feel like that decision just, it was just not competitive enough for me no more in high school. I feel like everything was just so easy. I mean, so I wanted to go to Kentucky and I wanted to experience that. So when the opportunity presented itself and Cal was like, yeah, I mean, we would love to have you on campus early. <laughs> I was like, yes, no brainer. Why wouldn't I go learn from Aaron Fox and my band who I just seen last night to it? Isaiah Briscoe and just sit there and learn from them and then I could play if I want to as well. So it was a time when I went there where he was actually really thinking about me playing. And now that I like sit back at it, I should have actually played. Like I felt like I should have played. And maybe I would have left that year, maybe I wouldn't have, but I feel like I just still should have played to just get that experience with them and just be able to take the floor with that many great players and just at that young age being tossed into that environment with all the obstacles against me and see like where I was stacked up and see what would happen. And, but I didn't play and I went and I tested the, the waters for the draft and, and I had a great draft process and I just ultimately chose to just come back. And I felt like I felt like I could have left and I felt like I could have been a first rounder. I like strongly believe if I would have went in the draft that year, I would have been a first rounder for sure. I mean, there was just so many teams and I was like the mystery of the draft, quote unquote, and I feel like it would have, I would have been a first round there, but I feel like my whole situation in the league would have just been so much different. Because I don't feel like I was fully ready. So like that's the main reason why I went, I went back to Kentucky because I didn't feel like I was ready. And I didn't want to really play in the G League much. And I knew if I would have did that, I would have played in the G League a lot just because I was so young. Nobody has seen me play for a year, or maybe not, because the league is now being in the league for, for, for so long, I feel like the league is all about it's all about height and it's all about how you come in and it's all about what you run with. So you can come in and you can be that mystery player and you come in and you play good basketball, that wave is just gonna keep going and it's never gonna stop until you until God stops in one day. So yeah, then I went back and I played and I feel like I had a Okay, yeah. Of course, I had some uh, adversity. I had some time. But I was probably the worst player on the team at times. And that just comes back to somebody that was at Kentucky, uh, Coach Kenny Payne. I mean, I just talked to him day after day, day in and day out. And he was just always just telling me, like, they're not going to give it to you. They're not going to give you nothing. So either you're going to work or you're just going to sit down and be mad about it. But nothing that you want is going to be handed to you. So I mean, he was like he was uh, he was like a father figure for me on campus. Like through my dark moments, through my dark times, through the whole university turning against me because I was playing bad games. Like I couldn't even go on social media. Sometimes I didn't even want to walk around campus. That's how real it was. I mean, and that's that's why I say Kentucky's like the league. It's like the fans are so attached to basketball. It's like 
I played five bad games. I was like the second highest recruit to come on campus. I played five bad games. They was like, why is this guy playing? Why is he on the court? Cal sitting down. He doesn't belong here. So we got to rewind a little bit, man. I mean, any kid left Rack City, in New York, you know what I'm saying? Like, you get your hand, I mean, excuse me, you get your name called, man, NBA draft. Like, walk me through what that experience was like, what that moment was like hearing your name called, just what that day was like. What do you remember about it, man? Because, again, for me, like, just seeing when I first met you and where you were and seeing all of that culminate with you hearing your name called in the NBA draft, bro, I felt like I got drafted that day. I was like, yo, like, that's crazy, yeah. like. Man, we made it, you feel me? Like, yeah. for you, just talk to me about what that day was like, man, what that moment was like for you. Just, you know, having all your work over the years culminate in and hearing your name called on, on draft night. Yeah, so I feel like when I, when I was at Kentucky, I mean, as soon as I got there, I couldn't stop thinking about being drafted. So I feel like it wasn't, it wasn't the way that I always envisioned it. That's not how, how it occurred. Like, I envisioned being invited to the green room, having my whole family with me at the green room, having my own table, having all of that luxury stuff. But it wasn't like that. So, I mean, I'm a New York kid. So if usually when you're not invited to the green room, you're not going to the draft for real. And I just remember the whole day was like a blur and everything was happening so fast. Everything was happening so fast. So now I'm sitting there, I mean, 45 picks, I mean, 44 picks go by before I hear my name called. So it was like, it was a long time. I was probably sitting there for like three and a half, four hours. Just sitting there seeing all the players get their name called, texting my agent. I remember you texting my agent when like a couple of teams that said they were going to take me at this number if I was there, pass on me. I remember just texting my agent back and forth, back and forth. And as the picks got higher, I just kept getting madder and madder and madder and madder. And then I finally got my name called at name 45. How to be all drafted by the Brooklyn Nets. And I was sitting next to my mom. I just remember my mom shedding a tear. And I just remember hugging her. Like everything, everything that I, I was thinking about of you being a second round and stuff just went out the door once I heard my name called. And my whole family was sitting around me. I just hugged everyone. And then I remember, I remember whispering, to, whispering to my brother's ear, like, don't worry, I'm going to make everybody pay. And then me just saying that was just like sort of a way of me reminding myself, like, nah, I mean, we got drafted, but it's still a lot of work to do. Like, we got nothing guaranteed. We don't got no contract. We could go play summer league, we could get cut. We just, we just got our name called, but you know, when you're in your second round, you don't have you don't have a lot of roster spot, you don't have a lot of contract, nothing, pretty much. So I went out to the interview, I interviewed this stuff, and being a kid from New York, I mean, the whole city, the whole city literally was behind me no matter what pick I went. So, I mean, of course, I had, I had, I had a great time in the city. It was my whole neighborhood was out, literally everybody. So I had a good time. And then it was time to get ready for summer league, but I couldn't even practice. So, mind you, I got drafted, then I got traded twice. So, I could have practiced until the trade went through. And the trade couldn't go through until the uh, NBA free agency started. The NBA free agency started right before summer league. So, from June to, like, July, like, like two, three-week period, I didn't practice at all with the team. I was just there working up on myself, but I didn't get to practice because I was technically not on the team yet. I think I was waiting for, I was waiting for Dwight Howard to clear the waivers. So I was in practice, and so like the day before my first summer league game, all the way it was clear, and they were like, right, I didn't clear the play. I'm like, what? <laughs> I didn't practice, I didn't do nothing. Like, I remember like being in the hotel, they're like, is he gonna play? Is he not gonna play? Is he gonna play? Is he not gonna play? I remember saying press from the GM Oklahoma, like calling the league, trying to figure out like is he gonna play, is he not gonna play. And then I finally got clear like one hour before it's it. I'm like, I'm playing. So like, there's no way I'm not playing. So I played the first game, I played well. Then the second game, I started, I killed the second game. And now the third game, I killed again. And then I remember that's when, like, I agreed with a contract with Oklahoma City. And that's when everything felt real for me. Like, that's when I'm like, okay. Like, that pen to paper. 
Yeah, pen and paper. Like I know this is this is this. Like I actually signed a contract now, so like okay, now I can relax a little bit now to figure out how to get my mom a house. Because I mean that was always like my my goal, no matter what. Before anything happened, that had to be done. So my first purchase was that I had to get my mom a house. Moved about the moved about the Frank City. And then from there, the work just started. From there, the work just started. But I remember that night, I mean, it didn't go the way that I expected it to go at all. But when I look back at it, of course, it was a great night. So once you're there and, you know, you're you're playing with OKC, you know, you're playing with guys that you were just watching on TV, Westbrook, Paul George, kind of talk to us about getting there, being able to play with these guys, learn for them, you know, gelling with them, that whole experience. Yeah. So I feel like from day one, I mean, Russell's my vet. So from day one, I feel like, I don't know, I felt like I belonged. Like, I wasn't that much amazed. I wasn't that much like that. I was just watching Russ, PG, and all these guys for the last 10 years. And I wasn't, it was none of that for me. I was just like, I want to see, like, where I line up with them. I want to see, like, can I compete? What is it going to look like? Can I even get minutes? Because my new back, I drafted. I get drafted again, second round, and usually the European G League the whole year. I'm, I'm drafted to a playoff team. They got eight solid rotation guys. There's no way, there's no way I'm going to get a minute on the court. So I'm just like, let me see where I line up with these guys. And my U.S. being my bet, of course, I'm bouncing things off and I'm learning from them every day. I mean, probably one of the best people, I mean, ever just by taking me in, taking me under the wing, showing me the ropes, and just always just being genuine and showing me love. Like, I could never, I could never not do that for the, for the next generation just because it was done for me when I got there. So like, even like rookies and stuff now, like when they come in, I'm always showing love because I know how much that means to a rookie coming in. Like to have somebody that is there for you, to have somebody that you would call a big brother, to have somebody that when you're on the road, take to get a stake and you don't got to worry about nothing. And money ain't really coming in yet, you feel what I'm saying? So to that, that made it very, very easy for me. Russ just made it way easier for me to be in my bet. Him being the player that he is, of course, everybody was just so amazed. So everybody would be like starstruck a little bit, but like I just put my head down and just try to work because I felt like I belonged. I don't know. I feel like everywhere I went, I felt like I belonged. And I felt like I had to prove something. So I just never really took my head off, took my head off the the, the goal. And the goal was to always just not just being an NBA, but to actually playing the NBA and make an impact in the NBA. So it's still the same goal and it's still just with the same mentality for real. I mean, there's always going to be doubts, there's always going to be haters, and there's always going to be people that think that you don't belong and think that they're better than this is that. But you just always just got to put your head down and just, just work. I feel like no matter no matter what you do, if you put in the work, everything else will take care of itself. So. Now, I mean, based on your response, man, it made me think like, obviously, right now, you know, Russell Westbrook is in the center of media attention. Everybody's talking about, you know, is he fitting with the Lakers? People have tried to question if if, if he's a good teammate, this and that. And obviously, after he left OKC. And Houston, he came to the Wizards, you know, my hometown team. So I got to watch him, you know, uh, and, and, and become a Westbrook fan while he was here in D.C. And everything that I heard about Russell Westbrook, man, is that, like, he's an incredible teammate, like, incredible person, you know what I'm saying? And um, it's crazy, like, just the slack that he gets in the media all the time. is always under a microscope. Um, from your time being his teammate, like, what can you say just about, you know, what he's like as a person, what he's like in the locker room? Um, and just what it was like playing playing with him, you know, and just what's it like for you now, just hearing everybody like trying to throw dirt on his name and like essentially try to blame him for the Lakers situation last year. Like, you know, for you, a guy that shared the floor with him, uh, shared the locker room with him, like, you know, what, what's your take on, on, on just Russell Westbrook? I feel like, let me see how I can word this. I feel like as a person, right, it's like, as a, if I take myself back and I had to like choose between every person that has ever played the game before, like who do you want to be a vet? Like 
of course, your first pre- people you're not going to choose like Russ, you're going to choose like the Kobe's, the Bronze, the Jordans, stuff like that. But now that I actually experienced that, I wouldn't want nobody else to, to be my vet. I mean, like, when I came in, the type of love and the type of like brothership and the type of friendship that he just showed from like day one to me, like just teaching me the road, teaching me like, nah, young fella, like you got to be the first one in the gym. You got to earn everything that you're getting and like making sure that I'm good on the road, whether if it's like I said, taking me to dinner, taking me out. Well, no matter what it was that you could think of, like no matter what it was that you could think of, I was taken care of. Like I didn't have to worry about it. It was like I'm with my family from day one. So like for me to have a person like that coming in the league and I see stuff going on on the internet, I can't do nothing but laugh because the real will know. The real will know and the real will understand. So like I feel like on the rest thing, I mean, that will always be my big brother no matter what occurs just because of the love that he showed to me. He didn't have to show to me. Like, you know, he didn't have to show me love. He didn't have to make sure that I was good. He didn't have to teach me the ropes. He didn't have to give me the advice that he was giving me. He didn't, you don't have to do that. I mean, he could have just been a vet. That's a normal vet, but he took it above and beyond. I always had the utmost, utmost respect to him for that. I mean, as far as the media go, I'm just let the media be the media. I ain't even really gonna get into all of that. I could just speak on what I know and what I know he's still doing till till still to this day. I don't think he ever gonna change who he is as a person. I can't see that. So the NBA, like it can be real serious. It's time to handle business. Sometimes it's time to have fun. But luckily for you, you got to have some fun, all-star game, slam dunk competition, all of that. Can you kind of talk to us just about getting there, competing, being around greats, ultimately winning, you know, everything that goes into just all-star weekend. It's not just that one event, but just the whole experience and then topping it off, kind of cherry on top with winning, just how that can kind of be versus how, you know, you have all those serious experiences, but now it's like all-star, you get to let loose, you get to have fun, you know, show what you do, you know, when you're not doing those drills, you're having yeah. fun, you know, just showing off. So like, how, how was that for you? Uh, I feel like it was great. Uh, my all-star weekend was in Charlotte. I get to, I got to meet so many so many people that I just like grew up watching and so many people was just so accessible during that weekend. It was just like a, it was just like all oh, mind boggling. And being able to win the dunk contest, I mean I was so nervous to even enter it. <laughs> and in fact it was like of course I knew I, I I could jump and of course I knew I had dunks and of course I knew I, I belonged, but I just felt like it was just so many obstacles there that like anything could go wrong. And shout out to Chuck I'm from Team Flight Brothers. I feel like he helped me with like my whole dunk rollout. And he made sure that like, nah, do the windmill first, then you do Shaq, then you go win the whole crowd over. And then after that, you're gonna get two easy dunks. So it's like the whole rollout, he just helped me with it and made it so easy for me. But I feel like, I mean, I got one of the most legendary dunks and dunk concert history, I mean, that speaks for itself. I mean, being able to jump over Shaq and then pull up the Superman on him. It went over a lot of people there, like Superman over Superman, but it was just, it was just dope. And then the type of love that I received after, and the type of recognition that I received after it throughout the rest of the weekend was just so much different. It was just so much more love. But like I said, it was a great experience, great experience. Huh? I'm looking forward to do it again one day, hopefully somewhere on the East Coast, though, maybe New York, somewhere like that. So so was the plan always to jump over Shaq? Did you go into the night knowing you were going to jump over Shaq, or was that, like, something you kind of picked up while you was kind of scanning the crowd, thinking about what don't you going to do next? Like, you know, ooh, like, how did that go down? Think about think about scanning the crowd and grabbing Shaq. <laughs> that, is, that, was, <laughs> that was definitely Definitely planned out. What? And did Shaq know? Did Shaq know you were going to do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He knew it was oh, a possibility. Right, right. He just didn't know if I could do it or not. Like, his words to me, right. he, he was like, make sure you clear me, young fella. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like, I knew I knew I had it in my back pocket, but I just, I was going to do last at first. And then, right. uh, coach was like, nah, do it in the first round. I'm telling you, do it in the first round. I'm like, nah, I want to do it last. He said, you might not make it there. Do it in the first round. I'm right, like, right. <laughs> I'm like, all right, that's so the first time I did the windmill when Russ threw me the pass. Yeah. 
say you got that big check, and I feel like that's what I just want. Right there. It's crazy though. And my last thing I was going to do D Wade, I was going to jump over D Wade, but Dennis Smith did D Wade before me because he, he was dump, jumping before me. So he was missing oh. a couple. And he just grabbed D Wade because D Wade had the ball. It was his last year and stuff like that. So he just grabbed D Wade. But I wanted to grab D Wade because, of course, the one I thought was my favorite player. So it would have meant a lot for me. So I had to substitute D Wade. And I ended up doing it. I was going to do a D Wade. I did it quick. So that was random. I just, I just asked Quinn would have been a dunk. That was that was that, that was random. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It was dope. Bro. It was dope. Bro. Thanks. I know that was probably a lot because I just watched this episode with Drink Champs and everything he says, it kind of hits you right here. So you're like, I got to make sure I really <laughs> yeah. clear him. So this is going to be the best dunk. Make sure you quit him, young fella. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, boy, I'm going to clear you for my own look in front of, in front of 30,000. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> So being that you did do the slam dunk comp, was there anything else that was like during All-Star Week that you feel like maybe like someone that you met or like a conversation that you had or just anything else that might have happened during that weekend? I feel like I met so many people, like everybody you could really think of, like I had a conversation with, like literally. It was like everybody was like right there just in such a distance. And then I became the kid who won the dunk contest. So it was like everybody wanted to talk to me, everybody wanted to take pictures with me. So it was like it was a different, it was a different feeling. And I was just talking to uh, one of my uh, old staff members at Kentucky. He was asking me if I still got the jersey of uh, winning the dunk contest. And it's crazy, I still got the jersey in my basement. And it's like one day I decided to look at it. Cause it still got all the rips in it and all that type of stuff too. It's fire. Um, so, I mean, I, I want to ask you about this, man, because one of the things that I've kind of just noticed is from listening and stuff like that, you know, one of the hardest things um, is not making it to the NBA. Honestly, the hardest thing is is staying in the NBA and making it to that second contract. Like, sometimes players celebrate getting their second contract more than they do, you know, getting drafted because it signifies, like, all right, like, you know, people want me to stay here and things like that. For you, being a second-round pick, you know, being a guy who had to get out the mud, you know, what was it like for you um, navigating free agency for the first time and then eventually being able to secure your second contract, you know, with the Pistons? Just walk me through that whole process, what your mindset was, and then what that experience was like for you um, ultimately getting it done. Uh, I feel like it's like thinking of an uh, uh, NBA draft, right? It's like that on steroids. <laughs> because, like you said, I feel like it's like the, the hardest thing to do is stay in the NBA. I mean, we, all, we all know that. So it's like you're fighting the same NBA. You're talking to different teams, you're interviewing with different teams again. You're trying to figure out where you're going to be. And I'm just fortunate that I was able to stay, I mean, in the city that's ready for me. And I feel like the city of Detroit, I mean, it's just, it's just a great city for me. Like when you talk about who I am as a person and what's my background as a person, I feel like the city of Detroit is the closest thing if it's not New York City for me. I feel like from the people, from it being people, um, like us from it being um, just a, so much of a loving, caring town. Like the city gonna be behind you no matter what it is. If you're taking care of the city, the city gonna be behind you. And I feel like it's the same thing with New York City. And being a kid from New York, I come up from the grit, the grind, fast pace, a bunch of things going on. And the city of Detroit is a little bit similar. I mean, it's the grit, the grind, it's a motor city cruise, it's like, they really come from that. I mean, and all the great Piston teams, they really had that. So I feel like uh, just right now, I mean, my home here in Detroit, I mean, I feel like I would have been. I feel like I'm good where I'm at. I mean, I love the city. I love the team. I love the coaches. And we're just working. We're just working. We're trying to, we're trying to achieve something, with, which is trying to bring back that type of basketball, bring back that type of swag, bring back that type of environment for the city. I mean, which is hard because it wasn't, here for a long time, but I feel like we got a great group of guys. Like we got a, we got a bunch of guys with a lot of different personalities and with with just speaking on mine. I mean, just having that background and just having that type of swag and that type of influence to the to the youth. I feel like that's what this city is all about. So I feel like it was just a no brainer to come back. <laughs> for real. 
So you mentioned, you know, you kind of feel like y'all basically have the keys, you know, working together, figuring everybody out. So now it's like, okay, as far as you go, of course it is a team, but you personally, what are some of your goals for the season? Of course, you know, to win at the end finals, but leading up, you know, might be some personal things on the side. What are some of your goals for this season? Uh, just to keep getting better. I feel like to keep getting better each and every year. I mean, like Drew said, I mean, it's hard to stay in. It's hard to stay in. So every year, you just keep trying to get a little better, keep trying to improve, and just trying to show my coaches and my teammates that I'm a better player than I was last year. I mean, in all aspects, not just scoring the ball and stuff like that. I wanted to actually take pride on the defensive side. I want to take pride in having a cigar, the best man on the floor, and being able to excel at that. So that's something that I feel like I want to open up a lot of eyes with on – that side of the court just showing that I'm way more than capable of doing that, but showing that I'm fully bought into that and that's something that I want. And when you think of how we be out of that's what you think of. That's one of the first things you think of. Like he's gonna bring it on the defensive end every night. He's gonna make it tough on you. I'm not saying I'm stop everybody, but just make it tough on them. I mean it's the NBA. <laughs> you can't stop. If somebody wants to score, it's gonna it's gonna be hard to stop them. Just make it tough on them and just be one of those defensive anchors in the league. I feel like that's one of my goals. That's one of my true inspirations, and that's something that I'm trying to achieve. I mean, whether it's this year, next year, no matter what it is, but it's something that I'm working towards. And I feel like on the other side of the floor, I mean, offensively, just keep getting better. Keep getting better. Keep proving those wrong. Keep understanding the game and keep being able to see things before they happen. I feel like that's the biggest thing where I've gotten better at from my rookie year to now is just understanding the game, understanding when to go, understanding when to not go, understanding who I'm faster than, understanding who to challenge, who not to challenge, and stuff like that. So just just keep getting better, keep understanding the game, and just keep playing my role. I feel like it all comes down to playing your role. So whatever this team needs out of me, it's just something that I got to be able to do for 82 nights. Now, you guys are a young team, man. I mean, obviously, you know, yourself, Cade, Marvin Bagley, just drafted Jaden Ivey, Sadiq Bay is one of your young cornerstone guys. Like, you know, I think much has been said in the league about, you know, you you, you need experience. Of course you have to say Sadiq Bay, DC guy. Yeah, of course, of course. You know, Cade, I can't leave him out. I can't leave him out. Sadiq Bay reminds me a lot of, like, of you, of you working. But just to touch on DC, he's a worker. He, he puts in work. And it's just something about those East Coast guys, man. He puts in that work, though. He puts in that work. Hell yeah. Hell yeah, man. As, as he should, man. Like, you know, obviously, you, you, you guys are a young group, man. So, like, you know, for you, what's it going to take for a group of guys who are all in their, you know, 20s? Some of y'all probably ain't even turned 20 yet. You know what I'm saying? But, like, how are you guys going to be able to compete in a league where it's, like, a lot of the teams are, are older teams. Our teams like the Warriors just won their fourth championship. Those guys are all 30-plus and been together for for X amount of years. You came into the league with OKC. You guys were in the playoff team with PG, who have been through the wars and the battles. Westbrook, like, you know, how do you guys, who are a bunch of young guys, um, you know, kind of turn that into wins and try to replicate similar to what, like, a team like Memphis has done, for example, where they've got a bunch of young guys, but they're still one of the top teams in the West. Like, how do you think you guys can kind of replicate that um, and turn that into wins, despite the fact you know that, that that you guys are a very young team. I feel like day in and day out. I mean, I live by the term uh, a penny a day. So that, that that phrase, I mean, you could take it as blunt as you want, or you could dig dive into it as deep as you want. I mean, a penny a day. I mean, when I dive into it, I think of every single day. What you're trying to do is hard. What we're trying to do is hard. It's not easy. Winning games in this league, night in and night out, is very hard to do. So. A penny a day, a penny a day, you get better every day. You lock in on film, you lock in on the court, you lock in on the of your body, and you lock in on the mental. And just every day, you stay on that journey, just every day. Just keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. And we just keep stacking good days. Just keep stacking good days. And just see where the chips fall. I mean, every night, we're just going to have to fight. Every night, we're going to have to fight. Every night, we're going to have to. We're going to have to go back against the walls every night, because like you said, we're the young team in the league. And I feel like you said Memphis. I feel like the big way they did that was just playing faster than everybody. Yeah, we're the youngest team, but I mean, we're the most in shape, we're the fastest team. And we're going to keep you on the heels all night and just see where the chip falls. And I feel like that's something that we've been adapting to a lot this year. I feel like we're playing much faster than last year. And 
we're getting better. We're getting better. We're, we're starting to understand I mean, what it takes day in and day out in this league to build a great franchise and build a great team for a long time. So just keep just keep stacking the days and just keep getting better and just keep running the home race. And don't let nobody try to speed up our race. Don't let nobody try to dictate what we got going on. Just keep running our own race and just keep staying in small town Detroit and keep putting in that work. Sir. It's definitely clear that you're more than just a basketball guy. You have your foundation um, and everything that goes into running the foundation. So can you kind of talk to us about how you balance running that, still making sure you're bringing A plus every time you're on the court and just even maybe some things that went into starting that uh, foundation up for you? Yeah, so my foundation, I feel like it's a big part of uh, who I am. Uh, I just feel like it's something that I always wanted to do is just be, being able to trust the youth that are, is coming up after me because, I mean, as a kid growing up, I didn't have a lot. I didn't have a lot of pros that I had access to or like just a lot of successful uh, men that I can talk to or ask for advice or just be around. I didn't, I didn't have that for me. So to me, it's just something that I, I, I want to do for the kids in my community and in any community that uh, me and my foundation is a part of. And, and families as well. So I feel like my foundation, I started my uh, second year in the league and it was just something that I felt like it was worth the investment. I mean, just being able to change the family's life or kid's life for a day, for a year, or so whatever it is, it just, that's what dictates who I am as a person. And I feel like that's my legacy. And I feel like that's what's going to go with me. So. I feel like as my foundation, I mean, one of, one of the one of most things I'm, I'm proud about is uh, my trip that I took to Africa uh, two years ago. And I donated um, so that I'm from a country in Africa called uh, Guinea, Konaki Guinea. And we don't have a lot of like uh, running water. So like running clean water. So sometimes you gotta like walk miles to borrow clean water from like different uh, neighborhoods and stuff that do have uh, the lines and pipes to get clean water. So I went back home and in three cities I built uh, running water wells. And just trying to give back each and every day. I had a basketball camp there. I mean, gave back a bunch of food, a bunch of clothes and stuff like that to, to, that, to the community over there, I feel like, because that's who I am. And I got a lot of big things in, in store for my foundation uh, this summer. Again, I'm trying to go back to Africa and do a lot of different things and just touch, just keep touching a lot of different people. And as far as in the city of Detroit and New York, I mean, the city that I'm too uh, connected to the most right now. Uh, I feel like I do back to school giveaways. I do holidays in, in both cities. Um, I had a great event in Flint this year, Flint, Michigan, got went out there, got to see that community, got to see what it's like, had a holiday, bouncy houses, haircuts and stuff like that for the kids. So. I feel like this, that's just a part of my legacy. I mean, being able to touch all those young kids and being able to see them smile for a day or two, that, that, that's better than having a good game for me. I mean, for me, bro, I just want to say, man, how, how proud I am of you for that, man, because, you know, we all know how many of the basketball player, you know what I'm saying? But for me to see you have you know, the Hamdou Diallo Foundation and to be able to, you know, see the things that, that, that you're doing as far as the giveaways and, the community service events, I seen you. I went to the bowling alley and you was dancing with the kids, man. I mean, uh, that that just brought a lot of joy to, to my, my heart, man, just seeing that, you know what I'm saying? Again, just seeing where you came from, bro, and where you started from and where you're at now and, and being that example. But I just want to let you know that, like, you know, I'm, I'm proud of you. And a bunch of people are also proud of you for that, man. You know what I'm saying? So I got to let you know that, you know, why you why you're sitting here in front of me, man. That's, that's you because coming from where we come from, bro, low-income neighborhoods, you know what I'm saying? There, like you said, bro, it's not that many pros that you can actually see with your eyes. I don't remember ever seeing an NBA player with my own two eyes when I was growing up until I went to the Wizards game to watch Gilbert Arenas, and I didn't even – I could only see him from the nosebleed seats. You know what I'm saying? So um, that's major, bro. I definitely want to give you, you know, give you your, your flowers for that, bro. You know what I'm saying? Um, on a lighter note, on a lighter note, man, we're, gonna, we're not going to hold you for too much longer, man, but – we got to talk about some fashion, you know what I'm saying? Because you, I think you're a pretty swaggy guy, you know what I'm saying? And uh, I'm one of our, our I'm favorite segments. I'm trying to tone it up a little bit. I'm just tone it up a little bit. Okay, okay. 
Um, I'm going to talk to Alexis, man, because one of our favorite segments that we have on this new podcast is called Match or, or Mismatch. And uh, it gives us an opportunity to talk about some fashion trends. You know what I'm saying? New York's pretty fly. Not, not as fly as D.C., but uh, uh, yeah, 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 pretty fly. There so go. I'm going to go ahead and let Alexis uh, get us into to match or mismatch, man. And we're going to see, you know what I'm saying, what your, what your, what your fashion bag talking about. Yeah, let's, let's do it. <laughs> so Queens, you guys have like a lot of interesting things. Some stuff, some oh, trends, man, some go. trends it, 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 some it, trends nice like I, I don't know. So were there any <laughs> trends like that you kind of saw in Queens as you were growing up that you were like, I can't really get with that one? I feel like I did every trend in New York. I, I mean I have to. I'm a New Yorker, so it's like how can I embrace being a New Yorker and not you know, every trend that New York has started, like, I did the Tims, I did the baggy jeans, I did the skinny jeans, I did the uh, vest, I did the one, the one uh, jeans, suit jumpers, I mean, I, I had to do everything, I still do the, the white a AF1s, probably got like 10 pairs, just always gotta have a fresh pair of white ups, that's an East Coast thing, I'm pretty sure y'all, y'all do that too, right? All right. So, it depends. Oh uh, man, I mean, I feel like right now, like a trend from New York that I, that, I, that I'm kind of off of. I would say is like the Tims. I'm kind of like I'm kind of done with the Tims. <laughs> I'm putting those up, and I mean, since I call it match or mismatch, I mean, I feel like anybody that's matching from head to toe that is not fashion. Thanks. Not fashion. Matching from head to toe is not fashion. And we, we started to call, like, me and my boys, like, we be starting to call, like, a lot of people, like, the mannequin channel. Because a lot of people are they, they just dressing like mannequins. Like, I don't want to see you in designer from head to toe. I don't, that's not fashion to me. So it's Thanks. Just, like, you got to have you gotta have some swag. With you. Everybody got their own little soft switch. But matching the mannequins, we ain't doing that. Okay, so can you kind of talk to us about maybe one of your most recent outfits that you're like, okay, one, I really have it on, and like what you did. So like as far as like, so let's say it's a shirt, pant, and shoe combo. So what did you do to cop the hat? Did you get the shoe through a sneaky plug? Just like, so basically your favorite outfit and kind of what, what you went through to cop the outfit, basically. I feel like most of my favorite outfits be like simple. Like just simple, like good pieces that were like when you see it, you'd be like, What's that? Like, what you got on? And then when I say it, like nobody really knows. But I just I go with my the last time I really, really dressed up was probably like on my birthday. I use a lot. So <laughs> I'm gonna go with birthday fit. I think I had on like just I had on like a little uh, vest, a little black. I was wearing all black, just like all black Tom settle, couple uh some shades on, a couple of chains, accessories and stuff like that. But I feel like most of my fits is just simple. Like I had on like some Fear of God, um, some like Fear of God boots. Uh, I had on a Givenchy suit. It was like with a vest, and I just had on like a simple like twenty dollar black t shirt. So it was like I had on a hat, and I just put on some shades. And I feel like that's just. I feel like my best fits be like my simplest fits, but. I feel like I had a phase though when I went to like I was just buying so much designer. I just went designer, 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 designer. And it's like that ain't fashion. <laughs> I just had to go through it to see that 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 ain't it. I feel like my best fits now is like when I when I just went like I got designer this, but my shirt might be ten dollars. You feel me? My pants really might be thirty dollars, but my top might be a couple hundred. Oh, my jacket is a couple thousand and everything else is like a couple hundred. You feel me? So it's like right. just missing and matching. I don't want to be walking around in my, I mean, sometimes, of course, in my whole fit is like Louis hat, Louis glasses, Louis shirt, Louis, Louis jacket. It's like, I didn't really, I didn't really want to see no more. But I'll have some dope accessories. But I've mostly been on like underground brands. I've been trying to find like a bunch of like underground brands, underground like dope designers. And just trying to like rock their stuff, get their stuff out there, get their stuff promoted. And mostly black owned too. I mean, like my girl had me in the fashion too. So like she be putting me on the game too. Like she real heavy in the fashion. So a lot of people say I get it from her, but you know, I got a little bit of swag in me. <laughs> <laughs> 
Way to way to plug the wifey, man, because that's that's gonna get you some points. You know what I'm saying? You a smart man. Smart man. Quick. Get in there real quick. So last question for you. So you know, being in the NBA, you're, you know, you basically have so many clothes and shoes accessible to you. If you need a pair of shoes, you're not, you, you know, let's be, you're not, you're not waiting in line. You know, you don't really have to do. Too That's much. not true though. That's not true. Really? That's not true for me. I I think correct us, because correct us, please. Everybody has different, everybody has different clubs. Like in the league, everybody has different people. Like, yeah, of course I got some plugs where I can back door and get the kicks that I really want to get, but I got to pay more, of course. I still got I still got like one or two plugs where I can get some retail stuff from though. Like I pay retail for like one or two stuff. But most of the stuff is like either I'm paying more for it or I'm like getting it from my homeboys. Like a couple of my homeboys are doing sneaker flips and stuff. But I still got a couple of plugs where I can hit them up on the side and you know, buy make me bypass the little the little uh raffle and stuff like that. I, gotta, I can't throw them out there, but I got a couple. But most of the time, like most of my stuff is like I either buy it for a little more. So do you most mostly start? I love it's like they getting, they getting it. I mean, some stuff too I get for free. Most of my stuff I get for free too. Like I got a lot of like great stuff for free. Like that I wear every day. Like, I got it for free. So I feel like that's one of the perks too that a lot of brands and stuff they want you to be wearing their stuff. So they'll just give it to you for free. So if you had to give us, you had to give us top three top three NBA players as far as style, fashion, putting it all together. Who's in your top three? And I can't say myself, right? No, you can't say yourself. But. <laughs> so of course, I'm going to go with uh, Shay. I mean, I played with him. And like Shay, he dedicated to that drip. That's one thing. One thing about him, he going to make sure he put that on every day. He don't got no slack days. Like, see, we have a person, like, I can wake up. And I can have outfit picked, and if I ain't really like in the mold, like I'm just wearing a sweatsuit. And I don't see Chase doing that. He don't. He don't put it. He don't put it on every day. Uh, another person I'm gonna go with is my boy Jay Vando, Jerry Vanderbilt. He played for Utah. He be putting it on too. He was my teammate too. So yeah, just a bunch of my teammates. And I'm a, the, my third one. I'm go with Russ. It's all my teammates. I respect you for sure. For sure. There's some sneaky people out there that be that be getting that be getting hit to the drip. I respect it. I respect it, man. Um, I know you're not dripping, Drew. I know you're not dripping. Yeah, I hey listen, bro. I'm 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 out here in Japan. You know what I'm I got the overseas uh-huh. drip. Yeah, I, I ain't even I ain't even seen the drip over here in the league. I got the exclusive drip you cannot get in the things. Since high school days, he's been trying to drip. Him and Aaron. I can't wait. Hey, bro, to I'm see a stepper, bro. I can't wait to see Aaron in LA. <laughs> hey look <laughs> hey look Ace don't put it on like me bro I really put that shit on you know what I'm saying you put it on better than Ace but Ace yeah you, know, Ace. you put it on better than Ace <laughs> hey bro listen bro. listen bro next time next time you see me you'll be like damn bro where you okay. get that I mean, hey, look, you can't get this, bro I know you went in the league but you cannot get this it's just that okay. Japanese I'm gonna hold you, I'm that gonna Japanese imported you, you said what when we doing the reunion we gotta do a reunion this summer 2023, man, summer is coming. Do that. Do reunion. Do that weekend real quick. We could do CT, then we could go to like Boston or something, something close. Like we could, we got to put that together though. That's, that's all right. So look, we doing we, that this summer, bro. Clear, clear your schedule right now. I'm gonna do a weekend in 2023. I was, I was there this summer. I was gonna put them this summer. Okay. All right. Look. I, hey, look, whole time the Hall of Fame ceremony, we was on here. What happened? You was out, you was out LA, you was out Cali. You know, okay. I'm, like, I'm, gonna talk, I'm gonna talk to you about that on the back end. Man, 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 man. So look, last question I got for you, man. Um, I throw this from all the smoke. I gotta give them, them they 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 plug, man. So we need your recommendation, man, for one person we should have on the pod next. And whoever you say, you gotta help us get them on the pod. So who you who, who you did so far? I seen you did. You did Queen, right? Yeah, Queen Cook was our first episode. Second episode was uh Stanton Kid and dropped yet. So you know what I'm saying. Second episode was Stanton Kid though. He played for the Jazz with at, with uh me and the boys a couple years back. But now he's out here in Japan with me. He played Euro League and all that kind of stuff. And you episode three, 
You know what I'm saying? So like, jumping along, we got we got three bangers. We got three bangers off the off, off the gate. I feel like I mean I really want to see I really want to see uh, you just name three men, right? You said what? You just name three men, right? Yep, yep, three men. Women get up here. I mean, I want to just see. I mean, I mean it could be anybody. I mean, I don't got nobody on top of my head though, but I want to see somebody influential get up here. I mean, and they don't gotta have to. They don't have nothing to do with sports. I mean, they just be talking about uh, life in general. Or whether it's just talking you, about you, you gotta give us a name because whoever you name, you gotta help us get them on. You got any matter of fact, we're trying to get some photographers. If you know any photographers that's doing some great stuff, if you know any uh any any investors, any fashion people that's big in the in the NBA, best styling people fits or whatever, whatever it may be, somebody who think will give us some some, some good gems, man. I got a stylist for you, uh, not a stylist, but he's a fashion designer. Um, he's a fashion designer, but uh, he, he go, he, his brand is called Sabon. Uh, he's originally from Detroit, but his brand based out of Los Angeles is called Sabon. In French, you know, like, yeah, in French, that means I'm good. Um, yeah, I would love to have him come up here. I mean, help him get him up here, let him talk about his, his journey in the fashion industry, let him talk about I mean, what he's working on, who's he, who, who he has worked with. I mean, he's worked with some of the best of the best in the game and just. Talk a little bit about fashion. I mean, I can put that together for you. Say Mamadou too. So Mamadou, all right. So yeah, that's that's you know what I'm saying that close. So look, so bet, man, listen, like I said, man, I'm I'm Mr. Put that shit on himself. So for me, I would love to have a fashion, a, a fashion designer on here, man. So say boom, we're going at the interview, I'm gonna go ahead and text you. And uh if you can, you know what I'm saying, make a group chat, whatever it may be, if you can go ahead and try to set that up, you know what I'm saying? But um Nah, man, this has been a lot of fun, bro. And uh, like I said, man, I definitely want to just thank you for, for coming on, man. It's been great been catching up with you. You know what I'm saying? Um, reminiscing, you know what I'm saying, on them old Putnam days. Well, like I you. said, the documentary, it's, it's still it's still I too much. We can't even tell y'all on this. It's still it's too much. Pretty we, pretty we can't cool. even disclose on this on this podcast right now. That, that y'all going to have to learn about later. I got a lot of hours of film that I'm sitting on too right now. A lot. So it's, you know, Say it, less. You know, but like I said, bro, I appreciate you, man. Keep doing what you're doing, man. Keep working. Anything, anything, anything y'all need from me. You know, I'm always here, bro. Always accessible. Always trying to, for sure. always trying to figure it out. It's all love, bro. So for sure. No doubt, my boy. All love, always, man. Like I said, man, we're going to be tuned in this season with Detroit. You know what I'm saying? Getting that back rolling. You know what I'm saying? We know we, we know y'all, like I said. Troy Weaver at the top, you know what I'm saying? So I'm I, I'm automatically a Pistons fan because it's, 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 it's DMV, it's DMV brand. Now my boy on the team too, so you feel me? Y'all like my second team now pretty much, you know what I'm saying? I got no choice, man. So we're going to be tapped in with you, man. Before we get off, man, I got to mention this too because Scrab and Espo will be mad if we, you know what I'm saying, get him a shout out as well, man. Those guys are, uh, you know, responsible for not only, you know, myself, you, Ace, Mamadou, all of us, man, like, um, I gotta give a shout out to those guys, everybody at Putnam Science Academy, man. And uh, I wish we could have linked up at the, at the Hall of Fame ceremony because that was certainly a special moment for myself. Yeah, we figure it out, you know, we don't figure it out. Please sure. love and them. That's that. Yeah. That, that, town, that town got more memories than any town in the, in the world for us. I mean, that's where that's where we really became mad. So we always gonna we always gonna be able to step over there and call out to this home. So. And, uh, sure. I can't wait to go back in the gym and play some play some ones though. So let's do it. Let's set it up. Oh so yeah, for sure. Cause you know I want smoke, just like how me and Ace used to cook human Keelan and them and them tools back in the day. You know, yeah. 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 I know you remember that. <laughs> Another episode of What's in Your Bag, featuring Hamadou Diallo. Man, this has been a, a wonderful episode, guys. Make sure you're liking this podcast, subscribing to this podcast. Telling a friend to tell a friend, it goes a long way. But until next time, folks, we'll catch you on the next one. Peace. Yes, Thanks for listening to another episode of the What's in Your Bag podcast with Andrew Robinson, presented by Bet Online. Please remember to like this podcast, subscribe to this podcast, and tell a friend to tell a friend, whether you're watching this on YouTube or listening to it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, Bet Online remains your number one source for all football betting needs this season.